I'm Dave Rubin, this is The Rubin Report. It's March 21st, 2024, and fear not, people, despite that horrific cackling, you're not having a stroke or any other sort of medical emergency. I am sitting a little lower than usual. That's right, we've got the trusty studio set up for an in-person interview. I'm doing a little bit later. I will also let you in on a little behind the scenes thing, which is that this episode, which appears to be live right now, is actually taped from yesterday because uh, this morning, Thursday morning, uh, I am on the Patrick Bet David podcast, so we couldn't get back here in time to do it, but obviously we wanted to do a show. This is all new material today, but with a slight time adjustment, uh, and you can check out the PBD podcast, and I think I'm also gonna be on Adam Sosnick's podcast, and uh, today we're gonna be doing a Ruben Report community Q&A. There'll, no Q, uh, there'll be no post-game show, because I'm actually not here uh, after today's show, and what we wanted to hit on real quick, you know, we've talked a bunch about Don Lemon. Don Lemon. Uh, over the last couple of days because he had a show on X. I guess he still has a show on X. They pretended he got fired. He never got fired. He wanted 5 million bucks and a cyber truck and equity in X. Then he's made the media rounds. Now he's the victim because Elon Musk was so mean to him. And it made us think that there are a couple clips, uh, one at least involving Don Lemon, but a couple clips sort of within the framework of people that cannot stop talking about racism that we wanted to show you. Uh, we've got a couple Morgan Freeman clips that are just fantastic. One of them I think we've shown you in the past, uh, but it really gets to the heart of what's going on here. We constantly talk about racism. We constantly talk about homophobia and transphobia and all of the other things. And perhaps guys, if we just stop talking about them, we could move forward as a society. I think so. So that's what we're gonna cover. And then a rubenreport.locals.com community Q and A. And before we get to any of that, let me talk to you guys about Arma. Guys, you ever wonder why some people just don't get sick? After strengthening my immune system with Armra Colostrum, I'm now one of those people. The benefits are truly incredible. Colostrum is the first nutrition we receive in life, and it's in an exclusive and it's an exclusive source of all the essential nutrients we need in order to thrive. Arma Armra Colostrum is a proprietary concentrate of bovine colostrum that harnesses over 400 functional nutrients to strengthen your immune barriers, your body's inside suit of armor, and first line of defense against harmful particles from the environment that can trigger inflammation and make you sick. It strengthens immunity, ignites metabolism, fortifies gut health, promotes hair growth and skin radiance, and powers fitness performance and recovery. Armor's Colostrum TM strengthens all four layers of your gut wall where 80% of your immune cells are housed. It's a rich, exclusive source of amino globulins, which are antibodies that optimize your immune defense during cold and flu season. And their premium grass-fed bovine colostrum concentrate activates cellular health for your resilience and recovery. In clinical trials, bovine, bovine colostrum was found to be at least three times more effective then the flu vaccine and preventing the flu. We've worked out a special offer for you guys. Receive 15% off your first order. Go to tryarma dot com slash Dave, that's T-R-Y-A-R-M-R-A dot com slash Dave, and enter code Dave to get 15% off your first order. And now back to me. Okay, so yes, Don Lemon sort of caught the news of, he was in the zeitgeist, let's say, this week. I don't wanna to focus too much on him because he's basically got all the wrong ideas. He didn't always have the wrong ideas, but he's decided to just give the system what it wants. It's sort of, I always say that about Stephen Colbert, he gives the system what, he, what it wants. Well, Lemon has sort of become one of, one of those people. Uh, but I wanna first flash back to an interview when Don Lemon was not crazy. This is uh, from about 11 years ago, 2013, uh, where Morgan Freeman was being interviewed by Don Lemon and they talked about we wealth inequality and racism. It's hard to, when you say that to some people, because they say, oh, there you go with a pull yourself up by the bootstraps thing, and you know, you're just being respectable. Not everybody can do that. Well, oh, everybody can. Everybody doesn't. Courage, courage is the key to life itself. There are a lot of people who are born in situations where they say, well, I just, I'll never get out of this. So they won't. I say to people who say, well, I, I would like to have done so and so and so. So you could have done it. So, well, I couldn't get out of here. Man, the bus runs every day. <laughs> <laughs> You're exactly right. Yeah. You gotta love it. Bullshit. Yeah. 
We are all born to different circumstances. Some people are born with absolutely nothing, with drug addicted parents. Some people are born literally drug addicted. Uh, some people are born into a ton, into multi-million dollar families. And then their parents are never around and they don't get that parental love and they're brought up by housekeepers. Some people are brought up in communities with a lot of crime. Some people, like there's every bit of that. It is real. We're a country of 350 million people. But everyone can decide to get on that bus, as Morgan Freeman puts it. You can say, I'm going to study this. I am going to get an apprenticeship doing that job. I'm gonna get out of this community. Like, and it may not be easy. I think that's the disconnect. And it's interesting because Lemon was never great. You can see that then. He wasn't as bad as he is now. But like this concept that like, oh, if we just had it so we were all equal, the starting point was equal and the end point was equal, that things would be better. And it's like, that would be the most anti-human thing ever. Would we, have all, would we all love to grow up in perfectly loving families with all the right amount of money and security and safety and all of those things? Yeah, but that, that's just not, it's just not human. It, there's just, humans are the, are the flaw in that perfect system. So unless you want to eliminate a lot of humans, then you're gonna have this uneven game. But Morgan's right, bullshit. Get on the bus, get out of town, figure it out for yourself. Doesn't mean you can do it when you're 12 years old, but maybe when you're a little bit older you can and you can figure out what that means. Uh, but here's a very famous clip. We helped make this thing go viral a while back. I, I think this is just so absolutely perfect, this answer by Morgan Freeman to how we stop racism. This is from the same interview. I thought what you said was fascinating because you called it bull when you said people can't, you know, pull themselves up. Do you think that race plays a part in wealth dis distribution or either a mindset that you can't Today? or cannot? Yeah. No. You don't? No. I don't. I don't. I, you and I, we're proof. Why would race have anything to do with it? Stick your, put your mind to what you want to do and go for that. Uh, it's kind of like religion to me. It's a good excuse for not getting there. You know, I said, and it's probably get me in trouble, but I said to some of my colleagues recently, said, so I know that it's an issue, but I've been, it seems like every single day on television I'm talking about race and it's because of the news cycle, it's in the news, but I'm so, sometimes I get so tired of talking about it, I want to I wanna just go, this is over, can we move on? And, and if you talk about it, it exists. Right. Yeah. It's not like it exists and we refuse to talk about it, but making it a bigger issue than it needs to be is the problem we have. Okay, so the easy part is, yeah, well, Lemon subsequently over the next 10 years of his life, largely because of Trump, Trump or the reaction to Trump, became the type of person that uh, talked about racism all the time. I don't even need to make this about Lemon. If we, if we never talk about Lemon again, he's gonna do this silly show, nobody's gonna really care. He got the thing with Musk, it blew up in his face. Okay, he gets a couple clicks, fine. But Morgan is right. I mean, think, think about just generally right now, the true reality of what it is like in 2024, America. There are no laws that discriminate against anyone based on race. Thanks to a lot of the actually racist programs that we've put into our institutions through DEI, uh, there is systemic racism discriminating against white people and Asian people and Jews. You have, I would say, unearned advantages actually now if you're black and hopefully those things will disappear because we should have a colorblind society, which of course was the, was the hope of Martin Luther King Jr for his children, right? And we all know that that's right and that's the promise of America and that individual rights are the most important thing. But this constant obsession, think about how many times uh, on my show on, and on any political or cultural talk show that you watch, there's this focus on race. And yet in real life, it's not how it is. In real life, almost all of us have different friends of different races and if you treat them differently because oh my, we have our black friends coming over tonight, we better act this way, or our white friends are coming over tomorrow, we gotta do this, then, then there is racism there. But most of us have moved past all of this. Now, ironically, the wokesters, by making everything about race for the last decade, they've started to, I would say, ignite a counter movement on the right that is a little more racist. And if you really think of all the things that the woke have done, like, does, does America feel more racist or less racist than it did, say, 10 years ago or 20 years ago? It feels a little bit more, but it's partly because of the endless obsession of focusing on it. Who cares if the vice president is a black woman? 
Who cares if Katanji Jackson Brown is a black woman on the Supreme Court? Or who cares if it was a white guy on the Supreme Court? Are you qualified? Did you get the right education? Are you gonna abide by the rule of law? Do you know what the Constitution is? Do you know what a woman is? Like some of those things might be important, but until we put that down, and they, they simply will not let us. The other thing I kept thinking when I was watching that was, man, I mean, nobody's really watching CNN anymore, but they would never have an interview like that now. And I wonder if Morgan Freeman himself, 11 years later, would be willing to have that sit down because he wouldn't want to deal with the blowback. But there he was laying out what actually was true. Stop talking about it. Stop endlessly focusing on it. Let people live their lives. Don't infect every freaking 12-year-old black kid into thinking that this country was founded on racism and the system is working against him. At the same time, while you're importing all of these people, telling us America is horrible, that's going to be a problem too. Like, how about we just stop doing that for a couple of weeks and then see what happens? Uh, anyway, here's Don Lemon doing the complete reverse. So that was all, those videos were 2013. And here he is in 2024 realizing he needs a new gig because ultimately he got fired by CNN for being a partisan, well, not even a partisan hack, just being a, a hacky old hack hack. What, what future do we want? Do we we want are, is this something we want to make a part of our constant dialogue forever? Or do we, do we want to say like, let's just move on and treat everyone, uh, you know, uh, according to just who they are as an individual. I agree with you with that. That's the ideal. But what the evidence shows is that that's not what's actually in practice. I think we're doing better than anywhere else. That, that's true. I agree with that. But that doesn't mean anything, that doesn't mean a lot to a whole lot of people who aren't able to take advantage of the opportunities that you are able to take advantage of simply because of the color of your skin. It's just incredible. I don't think you need me to analyze it that much, but for Elon to say it's better than anywhere else and then Lemon agrees, well then be grateful for that. And there are no opportunities that you don't have if you're a young black man or woman watching this right now, go out and get yours. And, and America never gave anything to anyone. You know, the implication is that somehow America gave white people this or that, or I don't know, do you think America gave the Irish anything or gave Italians anything or gave Jews anything or anyone else? Like, no, you go out and get yours. And the best way you can do that is by having families that are intact, by having communities that are intact and everything else. So I'm sorry that, you, that the, the union is not perfect Don Lemon, although somehow you became a millionaire and you're fairly talentless and, and you're really, I would say, trying to rot the whole system. But we, what we were trying to do in America was not make a perfect union. We were trying to make a more perfect union because, again, we can't get to perfection. We can get to something that's pretty damn good, which is what we've done. I want to show you one more of Morgan Freeman. This is from a couple uh, years back. He was on 60 Minutes uh, being asked about Black History Month. Again, his previous answer was we should stop talking about this stuff. Check this out. Black History Month you find ridiculous. Why? You're going to relegate my history to a month? Oh, come well, on. What do no. you do with yours? What, which month is White History Month? <laughs> no, well, no, 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 come on. Tell me. Well, the, I'm Jewish. Okay. Which I'm month is Jewish History Month? No, there isn't one. Oh. Oh. Why not? Yeah. Do you want one? No, no. No. I, 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 I don't either. I don't want a Black History Month. Black history is American history. How are we going to get rid of racism? Until... Stop talking about it. I'm going to stop calling you a white man. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you to stop calling me a black man. I know you as Mike Wallace. You know me as Morgan Freeman. You want to say, well, I, I know this white guy named Mike Wallace. You know what I'm saying? You know, I always say this thing about the thin veneer that the woke have, right? There's this thin veneer of some of this makes sense, or even the left in general, there's a thin veneer that their economics makes sense, right? Raise taxes, have more services, but it doesn't really work that way. There's this thin veneer of tolerance, and when you peel that off, there's a really like nasty person there. Like, look how simply, and I would say almost unintentionally, Morgan Freeman just exposed Mike Wallace. I don't think Mike Wallace, was a, he was actually a pretty decent journalist and, and a decent guy. But like when Morgan Freeman turns it on him, would you want a Jewish history? No, 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 what are you talking about? And of course you wouldn't, right? Of course you wouldn't, there would be no need for it. By the way, the black and Jewish connection as it relates to civil rights are deeply connected because all of the places that we think of as ultimately discriminating against black people, country clubs, et cetera, they originally were discriminating also against Jews. Jews made their way in and then black people made their way in. Like that's, that's how these things were connected. Most of the white people 
that Martin Luther King Jr. was marching with all those years during the civil rights movement happened to be Jews. But putting all of that aside, the, the, the thin veneer thing, that's why, that's why it's so interesting how few lefties will truly debate. They'll just tell you you're racist and then not debate ideas anymore. Because Mike Wallace's response was, well, how, how are we gonna stop racism if you don't have a Black History Month? I mean, it doesn't even make any sense. Oh, is there more or less racism? What does it have to do with anything? Like, stop, it's the same thing. Stop focusing on this nonsense. Focus on what matters. Do I, should I vote for this person regardless of the color of my skin because the policies they have might make my life better? Um, should I want that person to be the Supreme Court Justice because they under, have an understanding of the Constitution and they will make judgments that are, are congruent with our laws? Or do I just want all of the judges in New York to be black women, right? There's five judges now in the New York Supreme Court and they're all black women. It's statistically impossible. And do you think you've created diversity or anything else or just a bunch of people who think the same thing and look the same way? So they've done everything backwards and now I wanna wrap this all up by showing you this video from CBS in the last couple of days. Uh, here is a reporter asking a black married couple who they voted for in the past and who they're voting for in the future. And I think it took a turn that they did not expect. In 2008 and 2012, you voted for? Barack Obama. Barack Obama. 2016. I voted for Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton. 2020. Donald Trump. Biden. And who will you vote for in 2024? Donald Trump. Donald Trump. You may vote for the former president. I may. Why do you say that? My views on certain things have changed. I am very much so riding the fence. What are you struggling with? Being in a pattern of doing the same thing that I've been doing, because it's kind of like second nature. Like when you go in a, in a poll, you hit Democrat. Something has to happen. I mean, it's just so expensive to survive. And we're planning on having kids. I don't want to live in a stressful environment trying to rub two pennies together to try to make you see how the, the reporter tries to put her in the struggle session, like, how could you possibly do this? But at the end of the day, what's she trying to do? She's trying to have a family and she wants prices to go down and Bidenomics does not work and endless printing of money does not work. And that has nothing to do with race, right? J uh, Donald Trump, when the economy was chugging along, which it was before COVID, um, all time lowest black unemployment, all time lowest Latino unemployment. But it wasn't because Donald Trump was saying, I'm going to do these specific things for the black community. It was because when you start making the economic engine of the country work, it starts working for everybody. And you're like, holy cow, I've got a couple more bucks and I can go to this store and I can shop here and I can buy this and I can tip that person a little bit extra and I have a little more to save and all of those things. So I'm fairly certain that the, the two of them don't think Donald Trump is racist. And they've, they've sort of jumped that hurdle and more and more people are jumping that hurdle and more and more people are realizing that the, the division, this race-based politics, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, it ain't working anymore. And we need more people to understand that. And that's why in a, in a weird way, I am glad that Don Lemon made his return and that it caught fire the way that it did because Elon just disassembled him. And I thought it was worth showing you those Morgan Freeman videos one more time to just show. It's not that Don Lemon doesn't know this, he knows all of this to be true. But if you just give the system what, you, what it wants, eventually it can just get rid of you just as easily. And he ain't getting the five mil and he ain't getting the cyber truck and he ain't getting the shares of X. All right, let's get to a Ruben Report. .locals.com community Q&A in just a second, but let me talk to you guys about Hillsdale College. Guys, time is our most precious commodity. And I've heard from so many of you guys who have asked for my advice about how you can spend it wisely to improve yourselves and the people around you. That's why I'm so excited that Hillsdale College is offering more than 40 free online courses in the most important and enduring subject. You can learn about the works of C.S. Lewis, the stories in the book of Genesis, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, or the history of the ancient Christian church with Hillsdale College's online courses all available for free. That's right, for free. I personally recommend you sign up for American Citizenship and its Decline with Victor Davis Hanson. In its eight lecture course, Dr. Hanson explores the history of citizenship in the West and the threats it faces today. Threats like the erosion of the middle class, the disappearance of our borders, the growth of an unaccountable deep state, and the rise of globalist organizations. 
The course is self-paced so that you can start whenever and wherever. Start your free course, American Citizenship and Its Decline with Victor Davis Hanson today. Go right now to hillsdale.edu slash Dave to start. It's free and it's easy to get started. That's hillsdale.edu slash Dave to start. And now back to me. All right, let's jump into a community Q&A. Eddie says, uh, do you think Haiti could use a Bukele-like leader that has transformed El Salvador or is Haiti too far gone at this point? That, that is a great question. For those of you that have not been paying attention, I mean, Haiti basically in the last two weeks has become a completely failed state and armed gangs are running the streets and there's mass mayhem. We know that people are getting in boats and trying to get to America either by water into Florida, which ain't working out for them thanks to DeSantis, or through the Mexican border or elsewhere. Uh, there is a guy who apparently, since he has a child, has been known as Barbecue, who lights people on fire and occasionally eats them. Check it out, yes, he's a cannibal. Um, I am not an expert in Haitian politics, but you're asking about a Bukele type leader from El Salvador. El Salvador was basically the most dangerous country on earth. I was, I've told you guys a couple of times, I was in El Salvador about 12 or so years ago for about two weeks. Uh, to be there as an American or basically as, as anyone, really to be there as anyone, even an El Salvadorian citizen, if you wanted to be safe, you had to be in a highly gated community with armed guards, with tall fences, with barbed wire. We were told exactly what streets we could walk down and couldn't walk down, couldn't go out at night. They had people taking over people's houses. Gang members would just go and take, just walk into someone's house. This is our house now, take it over. They had, their murder rates were through the roof and everything else. Bukele got in, he finally got the army to arrest a lot of these people, break up the gangs. They have law and order. It's largely safe there. And your question basically is, can Haiti get one of those guys? I, I don't know, I don't know. Does, does Haiti need one of those guys? Yes, if it's gonna remain a, a state that's a functional at a, any level. But I would say even getting away from Haiti, like we need more of, of the Bukele type leaders in the West in general. People who, we played you a speech of his a couple of weeks ago from CPAC, where he talked about, you know, too many of us in the West, we're constantly worried about what the bad guys are up to. We're always looking out for the bad guys. And what you're doing when you're looking out for the bad guy, oh, don't they stole some stuff, they trespassed here, this guy had to steal this, he had to loot that building, oh, they could burn that down, oh, they had their reasons. What you're doing is you're throwing all the good guys out, all the decent people, and most of us are decent people, and New York needs a bukele, and California needs a bukele, America at large needs a bukele, meaning just someone who is just gonna be like, the buck stops with me, we're gonna have law and order, we're, we're gonna do the best we can so that you can live the life you wanna live, and El Salvador, they, he also transformed the economy. They're doing a lot with Bitcoin down there, which really, especially with the last couple of weeks of Bitcoin is really looking good for them. It's like we need people that are serious people. There are serious problems in the world. Uh, that's what I kept thinking when I was in Israel last week. It's like Israel has massive problems, massive, massive problems in a horrible uh, part of the world with a lot of people that don't like them. And they're a serious country trying to deal with those serious problems. And I kept thinking, man, America, we're not serious. Look what we're constantly talking about. Look what, we're just letting people run through our borders. We're letting crime exist, all of these things. When the shit hits the fan, which ultimately it will again, whatever that means, whether it's another 9-11 type thing or, or just something we can't think of, will we have enough serious people to be able to even agree on what happened or what we have to do or anything else? Like we better start thinking about it. Uh, Jeff says, the alligators eat manatees. Seems like they hang out in the same places. That's a good question. I don't know technically if alligators eat manatees. Uh, here in Florida, we have both alligators and manatees. Actually, one of my um, earliest childhood memories was being at my grandma's place on the west coast of Florida on the beach one morning and we were taking a walk. I was probably five, maybe six years old and a manatee had beached itself and was dead and there was some blood and there were all these people there taking pictures and everything else. And I think it had just died. I remember there were people that were had before we were told we're trying to get it back into the water. The manatee is known as the sea cow. I don't know that alligators eat manatees. Have you, were, can Crocodile. you? No, crocodiles eat manatees? Crocodiles are salt water, so maybe they're eating the manatees. Maybe. Alligator is more fresh water. They're not gonna be around the manatee. That's our, uh, Maritime expert Phoenix right there. Good question though, good question. Uh, Kathy says, I'm worried that Biden will pressure BB into a deal before Hamas is beaten. What is your sense after your Israel visit? Well, my sense is this, and I asked, uh, you should watch my interview with Ron Dermer, who was the former uh, American, no, Israeli ambassador to America and who's now part of the Likud party and, and a spokesman for, uh, for BB. 
Um, Israel is going to do what it has to do. They are in an existential battle for their life. They have over 100 citizens who are hostage right now. Uh, they lost you know, about 1,500 people, um, which would be the equivalent of something like 12,000 people if it was America. Um, they have an enemy terror state on their border. And the most fascinating part of that in terms of geopolitics from being there is that Gaza is in, in the south. The north is where Hezbollah has basically taken over Lebanon. So Lebanon, in essence, is a failed state. The government can't stop an Iranian terrorist organization from putting rockets all over the north. And we were up there, and we could hear bombs exploding and everything else. And everyone, everyone in Israel was saying the same thing, which is that the real war is the war with Hezbollah that hasn't even happened yet. They're shooting rockets back and forth, which no other country would tolerate one rocket shot into its territory. They're trying not to fight a war on two fronts at the same time. Um, but the real war will be that because Hezbollah is much stronger than Hamas. So in terms of Biden and the pressure, look, that Chuck Schumer speech was one of the most disgusting things I've ever heard. Imagine saying to any country, this has nothing to do with Israel or America or anything else. Imagine any country saying to another country, oh, you had, all, you had so many children and women slaughtered and you had people raped and beheaded and I saw the freaking video, it's all true. You had all that happen to you and thousand people killed and your communities destroyed and all that. Um, and you're winning the war, right? Israel's r winning the war, which is why all the bad guys, all the Hamas supporters on the streets want a ceasefire um, because they don't. If Israel was losing the war, they wouldn't be calling for a ceasefire. Israel's now in the last part, which is Rafa, which is South Gaza. And that's the, where they believe the remaining hostages are. They have to finish it. It's, it's existential for them. Otherwise, what's the point of being there? But as almost everyone in Israel said to me, we have no choice. We have to do this. We have to do it with or without America. It would be a horrible thing if America turned its back on Israel. Um, and I don't think it would bode well for America either. Um, but uh, I think they will do what they have to do. But that Schumer speech was, was an embarrassment. Schumer, I, I tweeted it out, but Schumer should, every time Schumer steps into a synagogue for the rest of his life, he should be booed or shunned. Uh, he just did a weak need, pathetic. They're still gonna come after you. Cause I can tell you, Chuck, having watched that 47 minute video, they weren't saying kill the Israelis. They weren't saying end the occupation. They were yelling Alu Akbar and they were yelling uh, kill the Jew. I found a Jew, kill the Jew and you're still a Jew. So um, this doesn't end well for you, Chuck. Like you sold out your people and you get nothing in return. It's sad actually, but, but I think Israel will do what it's gotta do and, and, and it will win. It will win because it has to win. Uh, Margaret says, Dave, what was your favorite thing with you and the team, that you and the team ate in Israel that you wish you could find stateside? Man, the food, the food was so good. You know, they, everything they there is fresh and they have very little processed food. We had a couple of great meals. Did anything really stand out for you guys? Like there was, I mean, the hummus there is just like, it's so rich and creamy and delicious. But... Oh, yes. So one of the things that they have, Israel's a very small country and they have restaurants, like legit restaurants at gas stations. One, there was a food truck at a gas station that was right after we went to the to the kibbutz that got completely destroyed. 900 people lived there, only two people lived there now. Um, and you can see Gaza in the distance. We uh, we stopped at the gas station. We had gas station schnitzel. Schnitzel is basically, uh, you know, it's fried and breaded chicken. Uh, and you put all the different vegetables on there and sauces and all that stuff. And it was, it was what's the word you kids use for food these days? Banging? Yeah. It was gas. That's what they say. That's what they say now. Yeah, that was, and then, and then we had a couple of great restaurants in, in Tel Aviv, and uh, yeah, it was, it was nice. A politically homeless mama says, your walking tour of Israel was incredible. It brought me back. My trip to Israel in the 1990s was truly life-changing. When I was there, there were political slash protest type signs against giving land for peace. That was about the time they were giving up or just had given up the West Bank. Did you see anything like that or anything protesting BB or any of the policies? Uh, I know Israelis are an opinionated people and wonder if you saw any of that. Yes, we did see some protests. You know, it's interesting because over the last couple of years, Israel has shifted rightward. There's, there isn't much of, uh, especially post October uh, 7th, there isn't much of a real left in Israel anymore. They're sort of like, they have their, it's, they're not woke there because they, they don't have time to deal with if you're a boy or a girl. They, they know the answer to that. And it's also pronouns are baked into their language. So that it's just not a thing. But they have like the crazy sliver of people that just absolutely hate BB and all that. And there were protests. We saw a couple of protests. We saw, um, you know, there are banners and things which are probably funded by American NGOs, probably through Obama one way or another, something like that. But they're a free Democrat society. And they're allowed to do that. I think one thing to your specific point is that it seems to me, and we met with many ex-lefties, which is always interesting for me to meet with. 
Um, uh, we met with a woman by the name who I want to get on the show. Her name was uh, Einat Wolf. Wolf, I think, was her last name. And she was a lefty, a peacenik her entire life, believed in land for peace and all these things. And now she just doesn't believe. She has fully had her evolution. And they used to think, oh, if we just gave them all of this, and they made many offers. There was an off before this modern state of Israel, 1937 Peel Commission, 1947 Partition Plan. There was the Ehud Omer offer, the Ehud Barak offer in the 2000s. And no matter what they offer the Palestinians, they always say no, because it's become very obvious to everyone in Israel. The Palestinians, it's not that they want a state. They want to make sure Israel has no state. That, that is a, an important distinction that many of these people have finally come to. And it's also an important distinction to note that none of the Arab countries give a shit about the Palestinians. Egypt could, if there was a genocide happening, which there isn't, Egypt could open the border, but they've got a stronger border than Israel. Saudi Arabia's taken in no Israelis. Ar Iran has taken in no, like nobody in the neighborhood has taken in, uh, sorry, not Israelis, has taken in any Palestinians. So almost everything you learn by being there, you know, I'm obviously like well-versed in most of this, but when you see the bullshit of the narrative up front, it's really just just absolutely incredible. Uh, Colorado says, Dave, my girlfriend and I have been together for going on four years and we often think about talk, think about and talk about marriage and the coming family life. I've been listening to a lot of great content related to it, such as Jordan Peterson and Nick Freitas, who you ought to have on, by the way, and want to know how it is you plan to pass on values like belief in God, good and beautiful culture, and meaning and purpose to Justin and Luke as well as teaching thinking skills and really uh, watch out for and questioning the current thing when they get over. Well, let me answer the last part first. In terms of watching out for the current thing, that's, that's like the greatest challenge that a parent could deal with, I suppose, in, in a time of iPhones and a time of social media and endless scrolling. There's always gonna be a new thing. There's always, you know, the thing that has captured this young generation, that there are suddenly Hamas supporters and queers for Palestine, even though they'd all be executed there. Like, that's the current thing. BLM was the current thing. COVID was the current thing. There's always something that comes. I would like to think that in light of what I do for a living, that I've built up enough defenses that when the thing comes, and let's say the kids are 12, and there's some weird thing out there in the ether that I'll be able to explain it to them in a way that, yeah, it may not sound right to them because uh, the, the current thing will have owned, owned, owned the entire mechanism around them, uh, but that I would be able to, that they would trust me enough and that I would be able to explain to them the way the world actually is without getting lost in all of that. Uh, beyond that, in terms of family and faith and the rest of it, I think the best thing that you can do, regardless of whatever your faith might be, uh, whatever your family life might be, is to spend as much time as you can with your family. Um, we're trying to do more of that with my family and David's family right now to try to find out what your traditions and culture are and know your history and all of those things. Uh, and as far as uh, beauty and things of that nature, you know, we're, we're very into getting the kids outside as much as possible. We go to the botanical gardens all the time. We like to get let them get dirty and dig around and stuff and play in the sand and, you know, pull flowers off of things and just like let them see beautiful things. And we, we spend a lot of time, we both into interior design, making our house look beautiful so they will be around beautiful things because that is important. When you when you are around beautiful things, you, you end up wanting to add beauty in the world. It's one of the problems we've had in our big cities as we've watched our cities sort of collapse and get dirtier and there's crime and filth everywhere. It's like people feel worse. You don't even realize it, but you feel worse. So it's, it's a challenge for everybody to, to usher in a, a more beautiful world. Uh, Shelly says, did you and the team get uh, potato barekas and shakshuka while you were in Israel? If so, what did you think of those delicious dishes? Just wondering, I, don't, I didn't have any potato barekas, did you? But I did have shakshuka. No, you guys didn't either. Uh, I did have shakshuka, which is basically, they get like a small cast iron pan. Uh, well, if it's a personal one, it's a small cast iron pan, tomato sauce, some different Middle Eastern herbs and spices, crack eggs in there, and it cooks, the egg cooks in the tomato sauce. It's it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, breakfast, and uh, I had shakshuka yeah, a couple times. A couple times. Uh, CP says, "Okay, I will ask and dare you to respond." Everyone, I mean everyone, is promoting books. You, two books, Isabel and Jesse Waters, and on and on. I only pay a nominal amount to stay connected. However, it's getting tiring for people to write books to supplement their income. Sorry, that's my opinion, but your thoughts? Um, well. Nobody forces anyone to buy a book. However, since you're a member of the Locals community, if you don't have either one of my books, we're gonna send this guy a book if he doesn't have one of them. So can we figure out who, let's, we're gonna get you that. Stay tuned on an email, we're gonna get you the book. I don't want any of your money. 
Um, you know, I did not write the books as a, as, well, I can't say I didn't, I didn't write, the, the intention of writing them was not as a moneymaker. They did make money and the book sold well and that is great. Um, the intention of writing the books was that I felt like I had something to say, especially for Don't Burn This Book. Jordan kept telling me that I should write a book and then the opportunity presented itself. Um, and then I think what happens, more than the money per se, because there's a lot of other ways, if you're in the world that most of us are in, there's a lot of other ways you can make money. It's a lot easier to just go on a speaking tour. Um, but one of the things that happens is when you write a book, because of the way the system works, then you're sort of pushed into the system. You can get on TV shows more, you can get your word out more. So I think one of the things that's been nice is that in the two times that I've written books, and, and maybe I'll, I think I'll probably write two more, I sense two more books on my docket, um, is that you're, you're then just kind of thrust in the mix because when you've got a new book, you're then on all of the shows and everything else. And if you believe in what you're doing and you think you're doing something good and all that, then it helps get your ideas out, out there. So I'm not gonna sit here and say I would have done it if, if I was gonna no, no, not make a dime on them, but it, but it wasn't my intention. But I would say truly, if you're, if you're part of the community and you are, you, that means you throw us a couple bucks a month, that is enough, we're gonna happily send you a book. Conservative Chica says, Dave, what's on the agenda for your off the grid time? I gave up Facebook, Instagram, and X for Lent, and I think I'll do the same in August. Well, that's absolutely awesome. I bet I would love to hear more about how you felt for that uh, couple weeks, and I have no doubt that you felt pretty good. You know, we haven't, we haven't thought about it too much yet. Um, we did a little Mexico adventure last year without the kids uh, for about a week and a half, and then, and then we were just kind of home and doing some projects and enjoying ourselves. And, my, my intention was, it was never that we had to like travel the world at that for the off the grid thing, which we've now done for six months. It was really just to escape the matrix and just stay off this thing. So I, I don't know what we're gonna do this year. Uh, maybe, probably a couple days without the kids, because I think that that, you know, when you have young kids, especially so much of your life revolves around the children that it's important to, to not have that at all times. Unfortunately, we have enough family that'll, that'll help us and take care of them. Um, maybe we'll do a little bit traveling. I really wanna go to Japan. That's like the big one for me. Uh, I've never been to Japan, and I think I've told you this on the show before, 1985, saw the back of the uh, Super Mario Brothers cartridge, 8-bit Nintendo, made in Japan, and I was like, I've got to go to that place. Uh, so I really want to do that. I also want to get there because Jiro, how old's Jiro now? Jiro's got to be 97, and Jiro dreams of sushi, and I want that guy to make me some sushi. So um, yeah, so we'll see where we end up. Uh, but either way, it will be without the news and the phone and all that. Talwe says, what are some things that you saw or learned in Israel that Americans could really use in our own lives? What are the, some of the things that America used to have that now seem to be missing in our daily lives? Well, I can tell you without question, my main takeaway there was like, trust me, I saw horrible things. I saw the 47 minute video, I saw beheadings, I saw, I saw parents killed in front of children, bodies of raped women, it was very obvious they'd been raped. Um, uh, like just unbelievably horrible things. Um, we went down to the kibbutzes and we, we showed you one of these videos, just burned out houses. These were humble people, lefties, peaceniks who wanted to live with the Gazans and then the Gazans ended up turning on them. Some of them who worked in their farms and things decided to tell them how many Jews lived in this house, X, you know, X amount in this house, Y in this house, et cetera. So we saw unbelievable horror, met, met family members of current hostages, people, friends of people that were killed, all those things. And then at the same time, uh, one night I was out at a club at 4 a.m. in Tel Aviv doing shots. And I haven't been out in the club in five years. And I don't have done shots at 4 a.m. in a long time before that. That the, the contrast between death and horror and this incredible exuberance for life and, the, and like that we will survive. That was the thing. We have no choice but to win the war. We have to survive. This is what we got. This is our land. This is our way of life. Like those two things existing at the same time and, and the not even the tension between, there is tension between those two things, but more so I would say it was like the, the coalescing of those two things I think has really made, um, made the Israeli public into a very special people that you really can only see if you get there because uh, unfortunately so much of what we see about them is through the lens of war and everything else. But, if you, but still, there are still people that talk about peace there. Like it's really, it's, it's just wild. Uh, Pat says, Dave, after seeing the uh, young women in your life like Isabel Brown, Emily Austin, and maybe less in your life, but I would also like to include on this list uh, Julie Hartman, I'm starting to believe that Isabel is right when they say they will save this country. But at 66 years old, I have to wonder, will I live to see it? How fast do you think change can happen? Ooh, well, well, look, I am, uh, let's say, bullish on this idea that Gen Z will somehow 
turn this thing around, right? Humans always go through, everything is cyclical. Humans go through phases. There are times of more authoritarian control. There are more times of freedom. Um, these young kids that are Gen Z now, they, they grew up in like a really bizarro time of COVID lockdowns and the gender stuff and the neo-racism and all that. Um, but I think the truth will set you free. And I think that more and more of them are speaking up. They're realizing that a lot of the systems and the things that they were supposed to trust, maybe they shouldn't. Um, I think they're also, and this is kind of one of the sucky things, uh, you know, they see the boomer generation holding on forever and ignoring Gen X, which is what I am, and ignoring the, the millennials beneath them. So, so much is focused on them. So maybe they'll rush in a little bit quicker where Gen X, I think Gen X largely was waiting for the boomers to kind of move aside. And, and the boomers have decided not to move aside, basically. Maybe they're gonna be like, all right, you guys, you're not doing enough. You millennials, you Gen Xers, we're just gonna jump you guys. I think it's possible. But I would say at 66, you got plenty of years left. And I would also say that whether, whether everything can be fixed or turned around, I, I don't know. I don't know if the, the massive problems that America has with the kind of unserious clown show that we have, if, if that can all be fixed, but there are pockets where it absolutely can be fixed. And you know one of them, which obviously is Florida, where we're doing things right. And it doesn't have to be this way, and you just have to, uh, in where it doesn't have to be the way it is in most of these blue cities, but you just have to decide, do you want to be part of that and try to fix it, and can it be fixed, or do you want to go to greener pastures? It's your call. Uh, Elizabeth says, what's the weirdest object Justin and Luke have decided is a toy? Izzy's current favorite toys are the dog leash and a bucket. Well, uh, Luke loves my electric toothbrush. He just loves that Oral-B toothbrush. He likes taking the head off of that thing. He likes pressing the button, brushing his teeth. Loves it. They love boxes. Like there's just no point in buying toys. You just give the kid a box. You pull the box around the house and you've basically given them a car. They love boxes, the electric toothbrush. Um, they love all sorts of kitchen things, measuring cups. Um, oh, I got a good one. I have a bronze shaker, you know, like a shaker for to make martinis. And you know, it has a couple pieces because you got the top and then you got the part that you can sift through and then the main canister itself. They love putting that thing together. Um, just like anything that's like kind of colorful or makes noise, banging spoons on things. Yeah, toys are just like, you give them toys and they're just like, what do you want me to do with this? Uh, OB says, uh, you used to be an atheist. What was the evidence that made you change your mind? Or do you feel that Bronze Age Middle Eastern religion just leads to a better society? Well, I don't, there's no evidence. I mean, right, you have to take a leap of faith to be a believer. So I don't think that there's evidence in like the most specific way you would say evidence. Um, but I think societies need to believe in something and need to organize around something. And I think, I think we got pretty damn close to doing a purely secular society right in, in America. Our founders were mostly believers one way or another, but wanted to create secular institutions that could stand on their own. And unfortunately, I think what we've seen is that the wokesters figured out that weakness of liberalism and they got in and they took and they just destroyed so much. So I think there's a, some people, let's put it this way, some people are believers because they innately, they can make that leap of faith and they, and they fundamentally have that connection. And I think there are some people, and I would say Jordan Peterson perhaps is a little bit more like this, I think maybe I'm a little bit more like this, that the utility of belief is enough. That, that actually proves the belief to me. Um, you know, there's a video that we've shown you of Jordan on Tucker Carlson from about a year ago, where he talks about in his 20s, he decided to tell the truth for truth's sake, because if, if you told the truth, he believed that that would put more order into the world and that no matter what happened, it would be better than telling a lie, and because he believes that the truth matters. That's a leap of faith. There, there's really no empirical evidence, I don't know how you could even quantify it, that, it, that just telling the truth will somehow make the world better. So it is a leap of faith to tell the truth for the truth's sake. I think that's pretty damn cool, actually. And that, that is a sort of utilitarian version of why you should tell the truth and, and what faith is. But maybe that's, maybe that's the point right there. Uh, hey says, uh, Dave, given the huge increase in issues with Boeing planes recently, do you think someone or something is deliberately sabotaging the company? They cannot really be as bad as they seem, or can they? Of course, their DEI policies could have something to do with it too, since they no longer hire the best and brightest, instead concentrating on diversity and inclusion. I don't know what is going on with Boeing, but we keep seeing these videos of tires falling off planes, doors flying off, windows cracking, planes that take off that have to land quickly. I don't know, I don't even wanna think about it to some extent. However, I will say that having DEI in any company, 
your engineers are not the best engineers because you've decided something is more important than whether they know everything about engineering or not. Your pilots are probably not the best pilots. It's exactly what Lemon was questioning Elon about. Once you do this, once you add that layer onto any company that is trying to do anything, it doesn't matter if they're making planes or they're making hamburgers, you will not have the best quality, right? If you were literally were hiring people based on diversity, equity, inclusion, we gotta have this many black people, this many trans people, this many blah, 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 and you were at a burger joint, over time you would not have the best burger joint. That is just obvious and real, and it could lead to surgeons who don't know how to operate and planes that fall out of the sky. That is a deeply depressing thought, and I better write another book so that I can get rich enough to own a plane. I think that's what I just learned. Uh, guys, part two of my interview with Isabel Brown is up right now. Her new book is out this week. Uh, there is no post-game show because I'm actually not here. I'm somewhere in West Palm Beach with Patrick Bad David. Thank you guys for keeping us independent. At, as always, rubenreport.locals.com. And we leave you with, with a match made in hell, Don Lemon <laughs> and Sonny Austin. We should not sanitize that word by saying this person called such and such the N-word. No, that person didn't call that person the N-word. That person called Sonny. I know you're going to get upset. That person called you or that person a n They didn't say the N-word. I can't believe, as journalists, God, that as you, journalists, as an African-American man, is going to use that word just Of course, so because, because we're matter, using and it. And you should know that. I'm, yeah, I do know that. I, I, have, I have said the entire time that I've been here, I don't think we should bastardize a word. I don't think it should be used freely in songs over and over again. You shouldn't use but it If you're at using all. it in context of a story and it is relevant, you should be able to say it. In fact, I encourage people to say it because I you're think you should hear the people to use a Because you should hear the impact of the word. It is word. our job to convey the truth and to tell people reality. It is it's not our job, job to realize it's not our job that there to are certain sanitize words that should a word. not be used. I'm a journalist. I'm supposed to use it. We're supposed to tell the I truth. Mean, We're not supposed me? to sanitize it. Oh my You're goodness. sanitizing it by wow. using that, by saying wow. that.